Hello and welcome to yet another MotorOne.com Test Car Happy Hour. Uh, this time being joined by our friends over at InsideEVs.com because we're going to talk a lot about EVs today. We've got we've got one uh, Dino Juice burner and an exciting one at that, and then we're going to talk about some electric vehicles that we've been driving, and we're going to have a little bit of conversation about what we think the very best EV you can buy under sixty thousand dollars is if you happen to have that princely sum. Guys, joining me today, I'm Seth, uh, Editor-in-Chief. I've got Mr. Brett Evans from Sunny SoCal uh, saying hello from outside. I've got Mr. Jeff Perez joining us from uh, Sunny, uh, well, not quite South Florida, but Florida anyways. Yep. Say hello, Jeff. And, hello. Uh, and welcome to all of you. We are going to, uh, as usual, solicit your questions and your feedback as we're chatting. If you guys have anything to say or anything you want to ask of us, please let us know if you're watching this on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you can just leave a comment or question right where you are and we'll get it. And if super producer Kyle likes it, he'll throw it up on the screen as he's done with our good friend Gary Clark, who is first in yet again to say, I've put my money where my mouth is on the answer with my first Bev ever purchased less than 30 days ago. The 2023 Ionic 5 limited all wheel drive. I skipped the 2022 kinks and got and still got seven and a half thousand dollars off the MSRP. Gary, first of all, congratulations. Ionic 5 is a car. Yeah, that's that I a think, great one. Like, yeah, we, we, we all love it. Um, we gave it an award. We gave it our Editor's Choice Award, in fact, for the uh, 2022 Star Awards, which is fantastic. Um, I think you're really going to love that car. So that's a, that's a great way to kick us off. We're going to hang that hang out until the last to decide what our favorite $60,000 e, uh, $60, EVs are. Um, uh, but in the meantime, keep those, keep those comments rolling uh let's jeff let's let's go to you we haven't seen you in a minute you weren't here last week um we what you you have been driving one of the three electric vehicles that we're going to talk about this week and one that is actually really close to the kia yeah or one really close to the hyundai right it is the kia <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i'm driving i just got done driving the kia ev6 gt which i guess is uh the sibling to the ionic 5 and eventually the ionic 5n whenever that gets here um but yeah it's the sportiest EV6, you can get uh, 576 horsepower, which is a lot of power, uh, yeah. 545 pound feet, zero to 60 in 3.4 seconds, which is uh, quicker than the base Taycan and maybe the GTS, wow. I could be wrong, uh, at least one of the Taycans, and 206 miles of range, which is the only bad number on that list. So yeah, it's a really interesting car. I mean, I really loved the, um, the standard EV six and I thought it was more than enough performance for like 75% of people, unless you really want something stupid fast because the GT is like genuinely supercar quick in a straight line, like three and a half seconds, 3.4 seconds is, is supercar sports car kind of numbers. Um, I, I would say the GB60 performance was, was about as quick. Again, the same platform, same sort of mm -hmm. idea. So those two are, are, were really surprising. But I like the styling of the EV6 a lot. I think the GT doesn't really go super hard on, like, the aggressive styling. Uh, it's got the bigger wheels. It's got, like, those, uh, what is it, acid green? Is that what they call it? Acid green, like, brake sure. calipers. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a neon cool. green. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a neon green. So I really dig it. Um, I had a, I had a really nice time driving this thing and it's, it's also like, uh, I mentioned this in my pros and cons review that went up the other day. Kia actually limits the output depending on what drive mode you're in. And I think that was kind of like a, a hidden thing. I don't know why they didn't, they didn't make it super public, but when you're when you're in eco mode, it's only about 200 something horsepower. You really have to go into full GT mode to get all 576 horsepower. Um, but when you're in those lesser modes and you're not totally gunning it all the time, it just feels like a normal EV6. It is super comfortable, super nice to drive. It's got decent cargo space for a small crossover. So I, I, I it's definitely the top of my list. I mean, we'll talk about this, like you said later, as far as like what the best EV I think to buy right now, it's mm -hmm. near the top of my list. It is, it is great. I will say that I think that with those, with those, you know, it, the wheels and, and other sort of subtle tweaks, the, G, the GT looks striking. I mean, this is a really great shape of a vehicle anyways. I think it, I think it hits a lot of notes that we, that a lot of us who are, who are car enthusiasts love because it kind of has that, like you're saying, small crossover, maybe kind of wagon-ish sort of body mm -hmm. style. 
Um, one, so I've been in the EV6, but only very briefly, and I didn't really get a chance to, to do a lot of stuff with it. Like I didn't do grocery shopping or anything like that. It's got such a low roof line. Is the cargo area compromised because of the rakishness of the design or? Uh, a little bit, but it's really not that bad. I think there's a good picture in there, Kyle, of the, of the trunk space. It's got a lot of trunk space for, for such a small-ish, you know, crossover wagon kind of thing. The, it, the roof line is definitely, the, the, the entry there is definitely a little tight. I think the design sort of cuts in on, on some of the ingress and egress stuff, but it's mm -hmm. pretty good. I mean, in, ter in terms of just space, it's not bad. Yeah, it's not quite to the level of like the, you know, the Mach-E that you're driving right now, Seth. It's not quite to that level, but yeah, no, it's it's solid. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely like a pretty impressive packaging effort on their part. You know, they they got a lot of human and cargo space into a relatively smallish vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and as uh, Kyle put in the chat, he started to show too. Brent, you did a you did a video first drive yeah. of the EV6 GT a while ago. Um, yeah. you, you still, is it, is it a car that still sits with you still near, again, we don't want to tip our hat too much, but like, is it, is it around the top of your list when you're looking at, at competitors in this segment right now? You know, honestly, it's, it's not super high on my list, the GT version, at least. Um, sure. if, if Brandon was here, he would, he would talk a talk a big talk about how performance oriented EVs don't usually like move the needle that far in terms of like their lesser lesser counterparts gary gary was also talking about how you know for him the all-wheel drive thrust is is spicy enough and i kind of tend to agree i think the ev6 gt line or the ionic um all-wheel ionic 5 all-wheel drive are sorry there's a plane flying over are sporty enough and like they do the job well enough that i don't think going all the way ev6 gt is necessary and it's, especially since um you know, they don't really like it's a, still a, a heavy car and they don't really do a ton to the suspension to make it really dynamic and, and exciting to drive. Um, unless you're kind of just pinning the throttle everywhere you go, which is which is great. And Jeff's absolutely right that like it is substantially faster than the regular cars um, in a straight line. Yeah. Um, and that, that, is, that is thrilling. But yeah, that's I mean, I, I agree with that that larger point of like a lot of not a lot, but it, but there's a good amount of performance EVs that don't really move the needle far enough in like the performance. The Taycan, I think, is an exception there, and there's a few others. But like the iX M60, Brandon and I both drove that, and we're like, it's not like it's quicker, but it's not like substantially better that you really need to pay this much money. I think the G the EV6 GT is way faster than the base version. I think if you really want a, a much quicker version then this definitely stands out. I think it's 250 plus horsepower more than the standard one, which is actually a lot when you really yeah. look at it. So I think in no, that it's, sense- it's a, it's a ton more power. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah, but you're right. The handling isn't like substantially better. The, uh, the adaptive suspension is pretty good, but it's still like a pretty big, heavy kind of feeling car when you when you toss it around. It kind of understeers a lot, but I, I think it's, if you really want straight line speed, if that's what you- you like then uh, it's worth upgrading here and do you know like what's the sticker on yours jeff and do you do you know off the top of your head like what the price delta is between kind of the next step down or the the top of the of the ev6 range um so the sticker on mine was just over six it was close to 63 sure so yeah. and that's about the base price for this trim there's really not a lot of options on the gt that everything comes standard mm -hmm. um and that's like a Let's see. It's like a almost a twelve thousand dollar, thirteen thousand dollar Golf uh, well, compared to the base version. Once you get all wheel drive, though, you you're closing that yeah. gap to more like six or seven thousand. And then mm -hmm. yeah. you know the, the EV6 is a little bit lack. The GT is a little bit lacking in like some of the luxury features. You know, you don't get heated. You don't get ventilated seats. I can't remember if you do get heated seats or not. Um, you do. But it's, yeah. Uh, it's still like a incredible, you know, performance bargain for sure. Mm. Um, the biggest like downfall for me on the GT versus the rest of the lineup is the range. You know, like I would, I would, I, I if it's not gonna like blow my skirt up every time I throw it in a corner, I would probably rather just have 250 miles of range instead of yeah. Instead of taking I agree the range with that. But it is, it is brilliant. Really fast. So 206 so miles is like really not great, especially when you compare it to like the Mach E GT. Um, yeah. which I, I wrote it in my review here. I don't remember how much the Mach-E and like the Model 275 Y. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I have it. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're sacrificing a lot of range there. And Kyle, I have a picture. 
this is there's a larger story that I'm going to do, and I brought this up a while ago of, of where charging ports should go on a car, um, and the one on the EV6 and the Ionic. Was the Ionic has the one on the back too, or is it is it in a different spot? It just annoyed me. I, I I know that I've been to a lot of charging locations for Electrify America that have it just like directly behind the spot, so you just back in. But the ones near me, for whatever reason, they're all sideways, like a um, like a gas pump. Um, and so trying to get the cord around there to that little port there in the corner, there's a picture of it plugged in, Kyle. It's at the, at the bottom of the folder I sent you. It's just impossible. It was so hard for me to get that thing plugged in based on, you know, the limited charging uh, spots that were available, you know, to the, to the two or three different chargers I went to. And it didn't make it better if you backed in or, or nosed in either way? No, it didn't matter because I did back in at the one that was uh, – so I was backing in and the charging ports on the right side and the charging stations on the left side. And if I pulled in, it was too far because the charging cord was on the other side and I'd have to wrap it around. It was a, it was a whole mess. It was a whole thing. But yeah, that was my one like big pet peeve. Real quick, backing up because I want to make sure that we got it right. Because of course we've got um, Gary, and then hello and and welcome Mach E Blog are are correcting us. My my guesstimate and saying uh, twenty twenty six sorry two hundred and sixty miles of range for the Mustang Mach E GT PE and two hundred and seventy for the regular Mach E uh, GT. So so we are close but not right. I just want to uh, uh, say too, like this is something that I'm starting to experience. Recently moved. I'm next to or next a block or uh, sorry. A, about two and a half blocks away from a parking garage that has charging um, for, for free if you're parking there, which is fantastic. But we're in, you know, a parking deck. So the spaces are, are angled and, and tightly put together. And one thing that I'd never really considered, because usually I was doing charging at outdoor charging places, was what, uh, so how, how it's, the car sort of becomes a, a piece in a puzzle in that way. And if the cord isn't quite long enough, if it doesn't extend enough, you are having to like maybe switch around to know exactly where the charging ports are back in. Uh, nose in depending on the particular car and it'll make an interesting point of comparison for these so um it's gonna so be yeah great. i don't i wonder why more uh auto my more electric cars don't do um because like the tycon has one on both sides of the front Mul fender, sides. both front fenders yeah. i don't know why that isn't more common um and to that end like gas gas filler necks too like it doesn't seem that difficult sure. to just have <laughs> two filler necks or two charge ports so i, I feel like that should be more common um uh, MJ42 Kramer asked how people felt about the Nero and Kona having them on the front. And I think that's great Brilliant. in this instance that Jeff's describing where, um, but I actually had a hard time. I drove the Nero and the Kona both a couple of, a couple of weeks ago. And I had a hard time with my charging situation, you know, getting the Nero in the, in the space and wrapping the like sideways charger around to the front of the car. So I don't know. It's just kind of like, I feel like unless there's a standard, it's going to be yeah. one half dozen of another. There's got to be a standard at some point. Even Electrify America is inconsistent. And I think that's just a result of the parking lots or wherever they're trying to put it, that they have to sort of cater to the, cater to the layout there. But like, it's just frustrating sometimes, especially with the, with the Kia stuff and the, and the Hyundai stuff where they sort of put them on the front or back. And it's like, you know, unless you, unless you have that back in or straight in charger, then it's, then it's kind of a pain. Yeah, absolutely. So you're limited by the kind of geography of the specific site. You're limited by, again, like what kind of facility you're in. And then obviously, like sometimes you're limited by like how willing you are to have a cord maybe stretching over the corner, or one corner or the other of your car, too, which, you know, the, some of us might have a very low tolerance for that sort of thing. And other people might have a you know, problem with it whatsoever. So um, very interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. Like standardization will help a lot here. Why don't we pivot quickly, Brett? I want to get to I want to get to uh, the the Alpha sooner rather than later because we're going to be talking a lot of EVs. But let's let's chat quickly about the Mach E GT as well because we, it's already come up a lot. Like it's clearly um, a car that competes with the EV6 uh, uh, GT as well, and a car that I had it last week. I actually have a new EV in my driveway right now, so I'm I'm going back to back on this. But first and foremost, like zoom out, big picture. Uh, Brett, you kind of mentioned it when we were talking about cargo space in the EVGT. I forget when I see these on the road. I've been in, I've been in a couple of a couple of uh, uh, Machis before, but I forget the actual interior, the size of this car, and the interior space afforded by this car. Right? It is a very practical, 
um, you know, like, like again, like small to almost medium sized crossover thing that just happens to be squashed a little bit lower. For instance, again, I, I'm sure that I've mentioned this on this podcast before, but my wife drives a 16 uh, Audi Q5 um, and she always has car seats in the back and we do a lot of our running around town. Um, she certainly does all of it in that car, getting groceries, small errands and stuff. This car has way more space. Like with with car seats installed, they, they weren't in this uh, when I did this walk around, but with car seats installed, um, I don't really have to move the front seats all that much to fit. There's tons of cargo space. Um, so this is actually a really practical. Now, it's not as practical form factor as it would be if it were raised up to the level of a, of a full SUV or crossover for sure. But but you you do have a lot of options for putting people and stuff in this car, which is fantastic. So that's every Mach-E. I think that the other the other thing that I was reminded of driving of this is just like, I don't know about you guys, but I am still really enamored of, of uh, Ford's, as you're seeing now, the screen and infotainment system here. Beautiful to look at, clear, bright, fast and responsive, easy to use. I still think the little screen inside of the the, vault, the knob, the multifunctional knob is a cool party trick. Um, and I just have, I have zero issues hooking up to this thing, mirroring my phone, like all that kind of stuff, I think is fantastic. Using the baked in software is good too. So, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Am I am I alone in my general my my general love of the Maki -E overall as a platform? I love the Maki. -E. I think I the Maki -E is awesome. I haven't driven the GT, but I can only imagine that that extra sort of performance just makes it that much better. The only thing I think the screen is cool. I'm not a big fan of the the vertical screens. Usually, just a preference, but like mm -hmm. I think there's a there's a there's a little bit of flutteredness on the newer Ford yeah. infotainment systems. I think they need to clean up like the graphics and the, the segmentation a little bit because like trying to look at some certain certain things while you're driving, it's like hard to see exactly what's going on. Everything's super bright yeah. and sort of all together. I love the I love that they kind of are like choosing to keep the driver display pretty minimal on that. Like it yeah. gives you so much more like forward visibility, for example, you know, like you don't you're not looking around a massive like monolithic tablet um which i like i kind of agree with jeff I, I don't love the like vertical i think sync 4 is awesome in a like the the 12.3 inch display and the um f-150 i think is great i don't think the vertical display does it quite as well but um no i i love the maki -E and the gt specifically I, I love the spec that you have with the like flower pedal wheels i think they look so good i love it beautiful Beautiful. And like, so, you know, we, we touched on it a little bit already. Like the GT is, is crazy powerful. We're talking about 480 horsepower and 600 and like 60 some uh, roughly, you know, pound feet of torque given, given driving conditions, incredibly fast, right? You know, you've got, you've got a good amount of range at that 260 or 270 mile uh, uh, range amount. Um, so really it's, it's bringing a lot of stuff together. I love like it's fun. It's fun to have, you know, the sort of like giggle machine feeling when you've got it in, in aggressive drive mode and you're accelerating really quickly. It is it is absolutely, you know, like, again, 10 years ago would have been the fastest thing I'd ever driven or, or thereabouts. Um, but I don't know, like as a as a purchase decision, that it's something that I can like it. I'm, Ford's not giving me quite enough, even with all that performance. To, to justify charging more money for it, considering the base car is is so good and so such a such a good like well rounded vehicle. So um, I'll say this time versus the last one, I got as I'm looking at it, like I got a little bit more used to the the button open uh, doors, especially with the little handle on the front. I still don't love those; they still feel a little bit finicky to me. Not that they don't work; it's just like you really have to aim your thumb to be able to get them. And I think it's um, it's sort of a solution in search of a problem in my mind, I guess. That's how uh, I feel. Yeah, it's it's better with the ledge that you can grab somehow at the same time because I don't have to really think as much. I can just plant my hand there and then and then hit it with hit the button with my finger and my thumb. But um, we're we're really like nitpicking at this point. At that yeah. point, like if 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 it's a car that you like and you really want to splurge on it or you kind of want to show up your neighbor or something like that is in my neck of the woods i'm actually seeing quite a lot of these around being in southeast yeah. michigan there are a lot of people who work for ford certainly and and maybe more of a hometown vibe on one of these um but i really really enjoyed my week in this car for sure uh, i yeah. will say that again going back to that that because uh, we're still working on the new place and getting getting home charging installed over here on the public charging solution where we've got this sort of dinky they're like six and a half kilowatt chargers or something like that 
Um, this is, I believe it's a 91 kilowatt hour battery pack on here, man, that thing takes a long time, uh, when you, when you've got it plugged in, thankfully it's, it's very cheap for me to, for me to be able to, uh, charge it up. But, um, but it, it takes a long time. It's a big investment in not having the car to be able to get it, to get it back up to, you know, 70, 80% or somewhere where you'd like to have it for the week. What, what is the max charging your... rate? Oh, go ahead, Brett. I was going to ask, can you park overnight at that spot? Were you, yeah, were that, you, uh, the, the hack is, and this is what I think I'm going to be find myself doing until I get something in my garage, but you can, all the garages are, are totally free and open on Sundays, right? So you can park, you could park, I could park it overnight on a Saturday and walk home, um, and just get it out of the garage for free on Sunday. So I could get easily 12 hours of charge. I can charge anything basically at that point. So it's, it's no problem if I'm willing to, to walk three blocks. So. I was going to say 150 um, kilowatt DC fast charging for this, right? Yeah. The, that's the only good thing. I mean, I know the Kia has like way less range, but it does have 240 kilowatt DC fast charging, which is pretty good. And it was one of the quicker, like plug yeah. it in and, and be done in 30 minutes, 20 minutes and, and not have to sit around. It was one of the few cars that actually almost came close. I know the stations are like finicky, but it was, it was fast. We, yeah, should, it depends. we should get like a, a, a slightly longer term review of both of these cars and see in a given like three week period, how much the extra range of the Mach-E compensates for the slower charging. Like see it like in three weeks, I spent really 219 yeah. minutes of the charger instead of, you know, X, Y, and Z, something like that. Well, somebody, so, so Mach-E vlog again, brings it up. He's saying that like, you know, in, in practicality, maybe the, uh, the max charge rate is actually something like 166 kilowatt hours, right? Like that's not unusual. We've seen that before in, in, um, sort of testing our, our good friend, Tom Malagny has obviously got a lot of experience with this. Like sometimes the vehicles underperform or overperform what their, what the spec is in terms of the charge rate. So a lot of it might have to do, like I'm talking about my personal situation, but obviously my personal situation dictates like maybe what decision I would make too, right? So if you're close, if if Jeff also has a public charging solution that's 150, that's you know like a fast charger around the block, you might you might be able to get by a lot a lot more easily with the the uh, Kia, for instance, at a faster charging rate and and smaller range, right? These things become really personal. Sorry, Kyle, I was talking and I did not. Oh, you got the Maki comment up there I, I miss what we're what we're going going for um uh yeah so so overall like i said very pleased with this one i, I think it's a great all-rounder um at the end of the day I, it's, it hasn't quite done enough to sell me on the on the gt turkis might have mentioned this either in a review or in person at some point but i will i will point out that the um seats are fantastic like the upholstery in this car is yeah. fantastic I still feel like a bus driver every time I'm in it. I cannot, and this is not just the GT, like the GT seats do not solve the seating position issue in the Mach-E for me, which is really high up over the steering wheel. And I just don't dig it. The performance edition probably would, because I think it gets unique Recaro seats. I gotcha. The, the, okay. standard, the standard GT seats are literally just Mach-E seats with like Alcantara microfiber trim. Better trim. But yeah. the GT gets unique Recaros. And that's like the, that's the big, or the performance edition rather. And that's like the biggest, most compelling reason to go for a performance edition for me. I, I loved the way the standard GT drove. I thought it was great. I like couldn't find a reason to go for the performance, except those seats are so much better. So, yeah, got it. I'm going to have to get at least one more, one more Mach-E GT there you go. on. Yeah. You got to um, experience the light up, light up pony too. You got to, I know I need that. that. I, I didn't notice uh, for for the for the viewers at home. We were as we were prepping for this podcast. I didn't realize I didn't. I drove the car at night, but I was never outside of it at night, and I had forgotten that you get the pony that lights up in the front. And I am absolutely a sucker for a light light up hood ornament. Um, call me call me trashy if you must, but I really really uh, dig it. So I want another car just to be able to take a photo of that. Um, all right, let's pivot quickly. I want to uh, all of again all of our friends who are here for for EVs, especially when we're talking about sixty grand performance EVs. Stick around. We're going to take a little break. We're going to pause. We're we are going to talk about a car that I promise you is very very new, uh, but uses a slightly older technology insofar as it burns gas. Uh, Jeff, you were just or not Jeff. Brett, you were just in Italy. <laughs> uh, tell us what you're out there driving. Yeah, I, I um, went out to Italy to do the um, first drive of the Alfa Romeo Tonale, which um, in U.S. form is going to come exclusively as an all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid. 
So that means it gets a 1.3 liter turbocharged four cylinder in the front with a six speed automatic transmission. I can't remember the last time I drove a six speed automatic. Um, And then it has a uh, 15.5 kilowatt hour battery and a 120 something horsepower um, electric motor on the rear axle. So total output is 285, um, 305 combined pound feet of torque between everything. And um, I have to say, you know, this is Alfa Romeo's first plug in hybrid in the U S and it is so well tuned and so well, like the, the handoff between electric and gas is really seamless. And um, they, they do that, that plug in thing really well, where when you romp on the, on the throttle really quickly, the electric motor gets you going. And then once the turbo engine is spooled up and the electric power starts to taper off, it kind of just that, that transition is really, really both really fun and also really seamless. It doesn't feel like lumpy and, and, and surgy like some plug-in hybrids can. So I, I was so impressed. I kind of was planning on being a little bit disappointed, but I just came away so impressed with how this car um, drove. And, and, you know, again, you know, it's a, it's a front wheel drive biased platform. Um, you can see there's a ton of front overhang. The engine hangs out pretty far over the front axle. Um, but because of that, that battery in the center tunnel and then the electric motor on the back, weight distribution is actually pretty good. Um, and it, it handles really, it's surprisingly like really fun to drive. Um, it's heavy because it's a plug-in hybrid. It's obviously going to be a little bit heavier than most of the competition. But um, so, and that, and that affects like the absolute limits of the car. But mm-hmm. when you're within those limits, it's so fun. It's just such a delightful little like responsive and fun. And the suspension does a great job of, of like, providing both good handling and a good ride. It's, I just, I was so impressed by the way that it drove for sure. Alpha has always gotten that, that balance of, of, um, you know, ride comfort and, and, uh, you know, kind of a well-tuned performance suspension really well. They're, yeah. they're, that ride handling, handling balance is something that I think is, is absolutely like in, in that corporate DNA real quick telephone dial wheels. I mean, you're just killing me like immediately, yeah. immediately. Oh yeah. When I see those wheels on any alpha, I am, I'm at least 80% in on it. Right. Like everything it looks else. great. Really I think the whole. I don't actually really think good. it looks great. That's funny. I don't uh, like. I actually <laughs> find it slightly awkward. Maybe Brett, you just mentioned yeah. the nose heaviness of it a little bit, and yeah. we're we're debating sort of different images to lead the, your your first drive of it with. Um, I think it's kind of awkward looking, and I rarely say this, but it actually feels like it needs bigger wheels. Like the stance is a little strange to me, or maybe they just need to be pushed out a bit. But but I love the wheel. The wheels themselves are are iconic, or a, a variant of a very iconic design, right? I, I definitely kind of agree that like the, the nose heaviness feels a little, it doesn't feel nearly as dynamic as like the Stelvio, the, the hood is so long. The cabin is pushed so far back in the design. So yeah. like, it really feels like a very dynamic design. This one, I agree. Like it's a little nose heavy, but I think they do a good job of making it look kind of like, kind of like a, like a, an angry, like an angry Chihuahua or an angry pug, just like a funny little thing that isn't going to do any real damage, but it's still just really cute and charming when it's like trying to be, trying to be, trying to be a big dog. I, I think they did a good job with that at least. From yeah. this angle, it definitely looks more nose heavy than it does in some other angles. But I think the, compared to the Hornet, which I really dislike yeah. visually, yep. I think the, the alpha design cues here looks, works so much better than they do on the Dodge. And I think you're right, Seth. There's something weird going on with like the wheels and the wheel wells. Like there's almost too much space, or I don't know what's going on there. But I think as far as small, like kind of luxury crossovers go, none of them are are that appealing visually. I think this one is is pretty good. The this probably is unfair, and I haven't like I'd have to look at pricing and all that to to uh, to actually compare them. But my mind immediately goes to like e-pace, right? As, as like something that, that like, you know, could have been, or may have been, you know, really well done, very attractive, great to drive and things like that, you know, from, from not a, you know, a legacy brand, but kind of a legacy oddball brand, something that's never been completely mainstream in the U S. Um, so I, I almost want to put Tonale into that, into that, uh, category a little bit fair or unfair, you know? Yeah, I can I kind of see that, but I it also kind of ticks the same box for me because the E Pace is a very front wheel drive looking vehicle, um, but yep. it kind of just like it it translates the Jaguar design into kind of like a like a <laughs> there's the bug there yeah. exactly Loki the, the Tonale is Loki in sheet metal for sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, that's hilarious. I, I like it though. The, the, I I can say the only like real downside I have with the thing is um, the interior materials are just like. They're a step down from Alpha, and they're definitely a step down from like 
you know, even like the cheap Mercedes, the cheap GLA or the, or the cheap BMW X1, the like less expensive cars, it, it feels a little kind of a bummer. And that's such a shame because I feel like part of the alpha experience is just like this, like flood of like leather smell when you get in the car and like, sure. you know, all this like evocative Italian, like stereotypes and, and uh, cliches and stuff like that. And it kind of feels that's where that's where the dodgeness I think kind of feels a little unfortunate. But yeah, otherwise... let's let's talk Hornet for a second because you guys like there was a lot of chatter as this re we were editing this review and Brandon obviously is recently uh, back from driving uh, the Dodge Hornet, which is for those of you who don't know and haven't seen it, like not only share a platform. I mean, they're really close, right? Like they are they're 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 they're, they're not you know. I always hesitate to say identical vehicles or ba badge engineering because I think that stuff happens a lot less. And I have not again done the due diligence to know what what Elf and Dodge have done to differentiate the things, but they're they're pretty close from what I'm hearing from yeah. the two of you, um, and uh, apparently close enough that that we suspect that we haven't done any real reporting on this that there's maybe somewhat of a minor schism inside of Stellantis too regarding the existence of both of the vehicles. Right, exactly. Uh, there's a source of some inter organizational beef, is what we're what we're seeing now from inside EVs. Um, there's, there's an anonymous Alfa Romeo source that says that um, the company was really, the division was really frustrated when Stellantis said that that the Dodge Hornet had to like take because it was I I believe the the car was engineered by Alfa Romeo, mm -hmm. and um, there we, there's an anonymous source that was talking to to some news outlet and then it got picked up all over the place that Alfa Romeo was really frustrated that like all of their hard work to build this, this, you know, their first like really, really truly mainstream American product, something that's going to appeal to a wide variety of people was going to get cribbed and turned into a, you know, 30 to $45,000 Dodge, um, which is a totally, I mean, I, 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 it's, it feels fair to me. I, I will say like the, it feels better as an alpha. Jeff talked about how it looks better. The front end of it matches the rest of the car a lot better. Um, doesn't look anonymous at all like the Hornet kind of kind of does. And I was playing with the uh, configurator and it's actually not the price difference isn't it's not that favorable. The if you go for a Hornet with um with the plug-in hybrid and all the options, the price difference is only about 3 or 4,000, dollars which, hmm. you know, that might be enough for some people to to go to go for the Alpha even though like the mechanical changes may not be as as drastic, but just having a having a better badge, having something that feels like it should cost fifty thousand dollars instead of you know a compact crossover from a mainstream brand. It yeah. feels like I think they we talked about the EV6 and the Ionic Five, and those are both basically you know using the same platform, a lot of the same mechanical stuff. This is this I'm not that's not an offensive thing to me. Like Seth said, like so many companies do that all the time, and it's not not a bad thing. In this case, though, it feels like the Dodge has like no identity. It's just it very much feels like it is an Alpha with Dodge slightly different I mean, design they even use the the is this the first time they use the dual like slash marks logo on on a dodge am i crazy uh, like, maybe it, they've done it with trims before i don't know if they've done it as kind of the leading like as the uh, lead logo like it's it. yeah, yeah exactly like they didn't even they didn't make an announcement there that they were like rebranding or i don't know it just felt very weird to me and then now it's kind of disappointing that to hear that the tonale has like such bad materials inside cuz yeah like you want the alpha sort of premiumness when you when you get in those. Well, yeah. so and this might be like a personal preference because I know I know a lot of cars in that class have like hard plastic door panels, hard plastic center console, um, and this this one has that too. No no getting around that. But you know it's class competitive. The issue that I had with it materials wise was the dash top was soft. It was like nice squishy soft touch plastic, but it was so glossy that it looked like mm. it was just like coated in armor all, um, which just felt really like. 1998 Pontiac Bonneville to me and uh and that was kind of a bummer so I feel like I feel like maybe that that's a really easy thing to change you could change that mid-year that wouldn't even need to be like a model a, a minor model change you could that's a really easy change so hopefully they you just, hopefully get, your, you just right. get yourself a pack of some really fine grit sandpaper Brett and you can you can <laughs> take, that, take that shine off in an afternoon no problem what I would do is I would just go get like a nice like embroidered uh dash mat with like my initials all over it like I love that. it but I go, go, go get like the Gucci logo embroidered on my dash mat it's oh cool. yeah Let's, Let's catch up on some comments quickly because I have to read this one from Yuri. Total, uh, total non sequitur, but I love it. Bring back, we're talking about badge engineering between former uh, Chrysler brands, essentially. 
bring back the Plymouth Prowler as an EV. So Yuri, this is a bold move because not only are we reanimating the Plymouth brand, which I don't think is probably in the air anywhere in the Stellantis HQ, um, but we're also bringing it back as an EV. And we're doing it with a vehicle that like, not for nothing was not a successful vehicle. When, I mean, I know it was like a very small limited production thing, but um, yeah, I could get behind that. Actually, I think I think that, that oh, would yeah. probably be something that would bring a lot of energy uh, to the internet. They just need to base it on the Alfa Romeo 8C. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Uh, uh, you, you've got lightning in a bottle there. Um, and then Retro Cars Forever says, I will say I much prefer the styling of the Tonale versus the Hornet and also nice shirt Brett. So we have to see Br Brett shirt. Oh, Back to the Future. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. We still have, well, that's that's a topic for a different podcast uh, and address before. Um, right on. Okay, so let's let's talk about the second uh, EV that I was driving in the, in, uh, the last two weeks. Uh, the car that's in my driveway right now, the Volkswagen ID4 Pro s all-wheel drive so um this is my first id4 loan this is I'm, I'm starting off with with the car that is the um the you know as good as good as it gets for id4 right and and i put this on twitter as i was and continue to be really interested in driving this car because of all of the kind of current generation of electric vehicles I, th I would say it's far and away the one that has taken the most criticism or that i've read and heard the most criticism about right um some of it is down to, like, let me start like by saying, I think that as an, an EV and as a automotive package, as something to just drive around, you know, again, we're talking about sort of a small SUV four factor, uh, roomy for me at six foot five and a big guy with, with lots of kids. I think the cargo capacity I've yet to, I, I, haven't, I haven't really tried to uh, push it to its max yet, but it feels like it's going to accommodate a lot of stuff. It feels like a vehicle from a, um, you know, like a, a size and function standpoint that can 275 miles of range on this one um this has uh the it's the dual motor all-wheel drive so it's got 275 horsepower it feels plenty peppy we're talking about the sort of extreme of the uh mass market electric vehicles this definitely doesn't meet the same thrill criteria as something like ev6 gt or, or mach e gt but it's quick right so uh, the, the hard points of it uh, as a as a normal vehicle, I think are and, and as an electric vehicle, I actually think are pretty good. Like it, it, this is a car that a lot of people could own and and not have a lot of pain points uh, where that stuff is concerned. Where it gets beaten up and rightly so is that using it when you're actually behind the steering wheel, as you're seeing me fumble around with right now in this video, man, there is a lot that goes wrong when you are when you are trying to drive this car, right? The uh, the steering wheel controls themselves. I don't want to spend too much time beating up on them because I think they, they've been beaten up to the point where I was recently out in Spain with Volkswagen and uh, driving a prototype of the ID7. And they basically, not basically, they fully admitted that they are retreating from that steering wheel with the, the touch capacitive controls on the steering wheel. And for good reason, um, I, they, they don't work particularly well. They, they work. Like, I mean, I, I'm, it's not like I'm... 50% of the time they work and 50% of the time they don't, they just, it's like you have to put a lot more thought into using the controls than you do with most other steering wheel controls, especially those with physical buttons, right? Um, and the infotainment, is, it's not even that, like on paper, it has everything that I want it to have, right? As wireless CarPlay and Android Auto, as wireless charging, it's really difficult to use. Like the, the logic of it is very strange to me. Like how, there's, there doesn't seem to be an easy way to get back to home all the time, I guess, which is a strange thing for me. I'm not always positive, like that, what I'm getting when I'm stabbing at the, at the controls. Um, and does again, that little blue square button stay up when you're using CarPlay or does it go away? It goes away. Yeah. No. Why? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, it's not always there. And, and this is another one where I always have to defer a little bit because we know that there, it's just as likely that there are issues with my phone as there are with the vehicle, but like I got it to connect to CarPlay, no problem right off the bat. As soon as I got in it, I've been in the car since Monday. Um, currently, if I walked in it, it would just be a miracle if CarPlay loaded up. I have not gotten it to re gotten CarPlay to reconnect, even though it wants to connect to my phone as a Bluetooth device. It's little stuff like that where like, I had the Mustang for a week. I drove it about the same amount, did about the same thing in it, you know, sort of school runs and running around town and one kind of fun drive there and back. Had no issues, did not have the same issues at all, like technology wise. 
And ultimately it did what I want a lot of vehicles to do. I want that stuff that's not about driving the car to just fall away. Yeah. I, I just want yeah. to be able to use it and have it not be an issue. And the ID4 is always kind of sticking its nose in, reminding you that you have to do all this stuff to listen to a song, you know? And that's that's a real bummer. So, well, the problem too is that it is such like a nice, pleasant car to drive. Like yeah. it's not super sporty or anything, but it is just a really nice, solid electric crossover. And then you get all those like bings and boops and terrible infotainment system. And like, it's just such a mess. And I, before ID7 came out, I went to LA and I saw the prototype and I talked to the the new um, CEO of Volkswagen America. And he was like very open about how our infotainment is bad, how the software is bad, how we need to fix everything. And I think he's said that, you know, in the past few months of like, they're going to go re fix everything. But yeah, that's the biggest problem with this car. It feels like yeah. it's a, a, a great mid-cycle facelift away from being a pretty solid, pretty solid machine because I, I agree with what Agreed. you were saying earlier, Seth, about how it just like it drives it's it's a lovely little compact crossover. Like anyone coming out of a Tiguan or a CRV or any of those, like they're gonna be yep. impressed by the power. They're gonna the and they they've done some updates to the range in the last couple model years. 275 miles is great. And I think it charges at 150 kilowatts, which is is good enough, you know. It's yep. it's great, and I literally think once they swap out that that awful capacitive touch um, steering wheel and and the um, and they actually backlight the climate and volume controls, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to finally be like a very competitive, no you know no uh, no qualifications needed, just a good solid SUV. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think that they're I think that they're pretty close with it. Um, I will say, like you know, again, the the ride quality is really good. Uh, You're talking about some other cross. But I went to the um, uh, oh shoot, why am I blanking on the on the Golf Wagon? Um, <laughs> not the not the Golf Wagon, but the, the lifted one, uh, all track, right? All the track. all track bit. Very very similar experience to me in terms of like again, just normal driving. I'm not going off road or anything, but I I think that this has the ability to be the right the right kind of vehicle for a great number of people. Um, but it's not, and, and just to, just to hit on it too, again, like, because we're maybe fewer people are familiar with it. Like the, when you've got the dual motor, when you've got, um, all that power, like it can go from being uh, spirited, or, you know, from being regular to spirited really quickly, like accelerating through city traffic is easy. Obviously like stuff on the highway is, is a lot more, uh, kind of painless than, than you might have with the lower powered car. So, they're doing a lot of stuff right. One thing that I do like about ID4, again, having having recently been in the the upcoming ID7, is, you know, I I, I mentioned this in, in the first drive of, of that car, which I drove in prototype form, just to underline that. But they have they have really gone extremely uh, heavy in using in the the information in front of the driver being presented in the HUD in the heads up display, and not in any kind of like physical screen in front of the steering wheel. And you can see here in ID4. There is a small but really bright, like easy to read screen that has a lot of information in it that to me is is helpful. Um, I get a little I get a little nervous making the big bet on the HUD being everything, even though I love the idea of my eyes being up all the time. Of course, when I'm driving the car, there are just so many uh, there's so much variability in terms of like what's happening with the position of the sun, with what kind of eyewear you're wearing and things like that where the HUD loses uh, relative to a really nice screen, even a small one like that, that's really discreet. It doesn't necessarily just well, do a lot of distracting. So you said it best. It's a, it's a problem. It's a solution in search of a problem, you know, like yeah. putting it, putting a gauged cluster nice and high on the dash right in your line of sight and giving you, you know, enough information to not be distracting, but still be able to, I, I, I kind of, I agree wholeheartedly. I feel like, Volkswagen maybe should learn the lesson when they tried to make everything so touch sensitive that technology isn't always the answer. Sometimes the old solutions are the best. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, listen, we're 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 reaching. Uh, I was just reminded by a meeting reminder that we've got about uh, maybe 15, 10 minutes left on this podcast, and I definitely want to talk about our favorite uh, sixty thousand dollar EVs to this point. So. Um, if I if I missed you in comments, forgive me up to this point. But uh, so so I, I talked to uh, Brett and Jeff ahead of time too, and I was like, since we're talking we're talking kind of about EVs in this space already. If if we went out right now, if you guys went out and you had sixty thousand dollars to spend on a new electric vehicle, what would be your top choice? And of course, 
Uh, Kyle, you can throw that back up in the chat, but I encourage all of you to weigh in too with what your answers would be. I promise you wouldn't influence us. Uh, the, the judges already know what our, what our answers are. So um, Brett, why don't we start with you? What's, what's your pick for, uh, for $60,000 EV? So I, this is, I'm not going to say it's the best EV. I'm not going to say that it has the longest range, the best charging, anything like that. Um, I just eminent, I find myself eminently charmed by the XC40 recharge. Every time I drive yeah. one, every time I see one on the road, I just think it's such a lovely little, little thing. And I had a great time. I had one a couple of years ago for a week. And um, I love that it's the torquiest vehicle that Volvo offers right now. It has the most torque that, that you can get in a Volvo and it's the smallest, you know, the smallest body shell that they offer. And I just, I find it so appealing. And, um, you know, now, now that they've done, um, the model year updates for 24, where you get a little bit more range and a little bit more, um, technology and there's a rear drive version available. If you don't need all wheel drive, uh, it just makes it, makes it all the better for me. I just, I, I think it's a really great appealing little thing that would fit very well into my lifestyle and, I, stylish and it would make me feel cool when I got out of it, you know, kind of just like a little bit sophisticated and a little bit offbeat, which, you know, is the mystique I aspire to. So I, I love it. <laughs> I think it's a great little car. And, I, you know, again, it's not the best. It's kind of a dark horse alternative. It's I, it's definitely not the best vehicle out there, but um, I just love it. And I think it's such a charming, wonderful little car. Super. You you basically hit the nail on the head for like Volvo's value proposition for every car they've ever built in the last 60 years, right? Like not the other than maybe the safest, but like not necessarily the fastest, best, biggest, uh, most luxurious, but like a really compelling blend of all those things with quirky design uh, and they kind of go their own way. So I, you know, I've had limited time, uh, but a little bit of time in this car and I found it exactly very, very charming too. So I just, um, I just think they look great too. I think that it's like a really totally. modern, modern telling of Volvo design language. Um, the like the recharge components with like the, you know, the the um, kind of uh, what's the word? Just a, a, a blank grill panel, and it still has a frunk too, which is rare among ICE cars converted into EVs. I, yep. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Uh, great color palette too from Volvo always like really interesting but kind of like demure color paint colors as well so I love that and MJ MJ42 Kramer says Costco has a deal on the XC40 recharge $2,500 off you can go get your massive cheese pizza and your XC40 <laughs> recharge for $52,510.99 do they still have the cheap hot dogs they do still have the cheap hot dogs, yes. Oh, yeah. MotorOne.com and Inside EVs are not affiliated with Costco in any way, shape, or form. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we do not. We are not advocating for their deal, but that is, um, uh, as L'Oreal says, that is interesting for sure. Like, <laughs> as we put up the page, <laughs> Costco page. <laughs> um, that's hilarious. Uh, good, good to know. Good tip, uh, MJ42 Kramer. All right, Jeff, what's your pick? Well, Brett and I are both going Swedish. Uh, again, maybe not the best, fastest, yes. or best-looking EV, but I love the Polestar 2. I can't get over how much I love that car. And this one, this is the new 2024 model, which you can get, and it's, this is exactly how I get it. Black, 20-inch, those new 20-inch wheels, rear-wheel drive, um, and then loaded up with the adaptive cruise control, fancy seats, sunroof, and I think it would come in at just like right at, right at 60, maybe just a little bit under, but... To me, uh, the dual motor version of that car is awesome. Like it's super fast, super fast, super dynamic, really comfortable, but it's almost like, I think Gary said earlier with the, with the Ionic 5, like it's almost too much. You don't need that much. I think 300 horsepower, zero to 60 in 5.9 seconds and rear wheel drive is almost perfect for, for a little car like that. So I think that's my number one right now. I, I love the single motor version of this car. Quick, quick story about Polestar 2 and aside. I haven't written it yet, but I have, I have in my back pocket a feature that I'm working on about going to uh, Skip Bar Barber's three-day driving school a couple of weeks ago. And one of the guys that I met there was driving a Polestar 2 dual motor. Sorry, is it just performance? There's another performance package that you can get on top of that too. Um, and interestingly, he's not really a car guy. He's had a couple of EVs, never even thought about taking a track school. He was so compelled after getting his Polestar 2 by the performance of it that he thought, hey, I'd better invest some time into learning how to drive a car that's this quick and jumped all the way into Skip Barber's three-day uh, uh, um, racing school, which is like 
it's a lot like that's a that's a long way to go towards it wow. so i thought that was yeah. a that was a kind of an interesting story both vis-a-vis like what pulsar is offering and the performance of the pulsar too um but also you know just how how strange and wonderful this automotive enthusiasm thing can the, the twists and turns that it can take so um I love this car. I think it's a great choice. It was it was almost what I picked, Jeff, and then I decided to zag a little instead of instead of my normal zigging with this one. But uh, I, I'm going like what I, I guess what would be considered like straight mainstream here, just based on specs and like how I'd use the car. I'm going with the Tesla Model Y Performance uh, at around what fifty two, fifty three grand with the performance version of it. I mean, on paper, again, this car is almost unbeatable. Three hundred and three miles of range. 3.5 seconds, zero to 60. Uh, it's a great form factor. Like there are a lot of, probably a ton of these around uh, you guys where you live as well. Um, you like just, just fantastic, like practicality in this car with me, with a, with a small family. I think I could got, get a lot of use out of this. If it were just me as an individual, I might be tempted to go model three here instead of model Y because I like being a little bit lower and I like the form factor of a sedan a little bit more than a small crossover. But there is a reason and, and there's a reason that Tesla sells more electric vehicles and more vehicles almost than just about anybody, right? Like that cars like this, especially with the new price reductions are incredibly compelling value propositions, especially in the EV space. Uh, Tesla is a blue chip brand. Like, listen, there are a million holes that we can poke in Tesla as an automotive company and certainly in like kind of the ownership proposition over there. But just as a product that you're paying money for to buy and drive, I think that something like Model Y is really in the sweet spot of what people are asking for and, and kind of require in an EV today. So um, I, yeah. I think you're totally right. I have no idea how Tesla does it, but like it's a Mary Poppins bag inside. There's so much space for the footprint yeah. um, to the point that so my, my, uh, my older brother and his wife were looking for a car to replace. They had a Volvo XC90 and they were going to get a minivan because they needed more space for kids. This was last year when every single minivan was marked up twenty thousand dollars, and they yeah. they did the math. They said we could get a minivan, or we could get a pre-owned Model X for the same price, and they went with the Model X. And it has it it's much larger than their XC ninety was inside. There's much more space for them for uh, for runs to that big box store that we're not allowed to mention anymore. And <laughs> like there's you know like it, it it's amazing. Like they, they were kind of planning on, on being like, okay, we'll we'll have this for a little while and then once minivan prices come down we'll get one. But it, it fits into their lives so much better than they thought it would because it's so spacious inside. It's insane. Yeah. Now listen, living with one and again, like everybody, no, nobody is going to be surprised to hear this, but it's not like, you know, as uh, inside EVs, it's not like we have a special relationship with Tesla uh, re relative to any other automotive outlet. They don't let us borrow cars. Like if any of us want to drive a Tesla, we have to, we have to borrow one or know somebody who has one or make, you know, Turo one or buy one, right? Just like anybody listening to this podcast does. So um so that, you know, it makes it a little bit, we don't have the same point of view as car reviewers. We don't have the same access to Tesla as we do to, to other products. So, you know, I definitely get scared off as many of you do when I see a, a couple year old Model 3 or Model S or something sitting in the parking lot with like gaping panel gaps and things like that. That would definitely be something that I would want to dig into and consider a lot more before I uh, actually signed on the dotted line to buy one of these things. Um, but I will say like, you know, as a very high volume uh, version of a Tesla as one that, you know, in theory, they should really have locked in. They've been building it for a while. This is probably as safe a bet as you're going to get um, in that, in that ecosystem and the stuff under the skin and the packaging is just um, that's, that's the magic of why people are, are so into this brand. So man, remember um, when you could buy a $35,000 model Y and a $60,000 model S? <laughs> The yeah, prices no, on these have gone up just crazy because the Model Three I really like. Um, yeah, but even that is like over well, it's forty down to, something. Yeah, it's down in the forties now, which yeah. you know, considering it came out seven years ago with inflation <laughs> and all that stuff, like it's, it's ten thousand dollars in in ten, in seven years isn't a crazy egregious price. Yeah, well, Ford. I mean, I was gonna actually go Lightning, but then I realized that the the base Lightning Pro now is sixty grand, and you're like, Ooh, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. That's that's yeah. the price increase right there that you got to talk about. <laughs> that's that's why I think that the the sixty thousand dollar mark is really interesting, right? And it's not, you know, I'm not going to go out and buy a sixty thousand dollar car anytime really soon, right? And and even as we know and we talk about a lot, like average average transaction prices are rising, um, sixty thousand dollars becomes sort of more normal, I guess. 
for people. What it is to me is very interesting because it cuts you out of at least currently of some of the really exciting, you know, brand new brands like Rivian and Lucid, like they have yet to compete at that price point. Uh, Tesla is obviously there. Some of the legacy brands like, you know, uh, legacy, the, you know, like it, I, what, what do I even see it, say like existing OEMs like Volkswagen and, and Kia, Hyundai and Ford are in that space right now, but you can't get into maybe some of the signature products. So it's a, it's kind of a bright or around $60,000 is a kind of a bright dividing line between yeah. stuff that's really special that gets written about and talked a lot and stuff that people might actually consider buying right now, which sure. I think is, is kind of cool. So yeah um guys thank you so much everybody out there thank you so much for watching and commenting um we we really appreciate you if you happen to be watching this after the fact and you haven't gotten your uh question or comment in uh we'd love to go back to youtube after the fact and take a look uh and try and answer some of those um we highly encourage you to come back first of all come back next thursday we do this every day or, or every thursday at 2 30 eastern time on motor1.com and often on insideevs.com when we're talking about evs you can also uh, subscribe to this as an audio podcast on all the normal audio pl uh, podcast platforms, um, iTunes, the Google Play Store, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, uh, any, any of the big ones that you use, we should be on there now. So you can get us there too. Um, thanks so much for watching. Thanks you guys for joining us. Uh, don't forget to put, put your comment about your favorite $60,000 or less EV uh, in there so we can take a look and we'll see you all next week. Later, Bye, everybody. See y'all. Bye.